Chapter One of Harry D. or Making It Out, read by John Brandon. Harry D. or Making It Out by Francis J. Finn. Chapter One, in which I feel compelled to talk much about my early years and take a journey into the country to spend Christmas night in a very mysterious house. I hope the reader may not be bored, but I find it necessary to begin my story with a great deal about my insignificant self. I am not the hero, and yet, owing to a strange run of circumstances, am so wrapped up with the characters and events which are to figure in my narrative that I find it impossible to make any sort of a beginning without telling somewhat of my own early history. And to begin with, the reader must know that, when still a very small boy, I succeeded in throwing my father and mother into a state of terror by an extraordinary piece of conduct. One night my mother, who had a habit of stealing to my little bed to tuck me in securely and repeat her good-night kiss, found my bed empty. Not a little startled, she instituted a diligent search, and to her horror discovered me walking fast asleep up and down our garden walk. Of course the family doctor was called in at once. He asked me all sorts of questions and made me so nervous that I put an end to the examination by bursting into tears. Madam, he at length said in grave tones to my mother, you needn't be at all alarmed at Harry's somnambulistic propensities. He'll probably grow out of them. It's a, in fact, it's an idiosyncrasy for which he charged the usual fee. The doctor's learned opinion of my case was on the point of bringing my distress to a climax when my father led me from the room and informed me that somnambulistic propensities merely meant that I had a tendency to walk in my sleep and that its being an idiosyncrasy of mine was another way of saying that it was very odd on my part to do so. But, added my father, you needn't bother about it. Some people snore in their sleep. Others talk in their sleep. That's the sort of idiosyncrasy they have. Yours is to walk. My father's way of putting it not only dispelled my alarm, but even made me somewhat proud of myself. I at once looked upon sleepwalking as an accomplishment. Even at this moment I cannot, without smiling, recall my conversation with Willie Stiles, a very small boy with very large eyes who lived within a few doors of us. "'Willie,' I began, hastening over to his house, "'do you snore in your sleep?' "'No,' said Willie. "'Do you talk in your sleep?' "'No.' "'Do you walk in your sleep?' "'No.' I looked at him with something akin to contempt as I added, "'Willie, you haven't got any idiosyncrasing. What? gasped Willie. I can walk in my sleep, Willie, and that's an idiosyncrasy. Proud both of the fact and the declaration, I departed to communicate the news to our cook and housemaid, leaving Willie in a state of perplexity not to be described. The doctor's opinion, however, did not reassure my mother. Thenceforth, she rested but little at night. Seated in an armchair beside my bed, she would clasp my little hand in hers and sleep as best she might. Night after night she took her station beside me, and with sweet sadness do I remember how often the soft, caressing mother's hand would gently stroke my brow, how often the mild, sweet face of my mother would bend down to mine as I awoke from a start from some troubling dream, and how, as her loving eyes fixed themselves on me, her lips would touch my cheek, while her soothing voice would charm my dream-haunted fancies into peace. One morning, it was in my ninth year, I awoke bright and early, and as was my custom, kissed the hand that clasped mine. But the hand I had ever found so gentle, so quick to answer my slightest touch, was cold and irresponsive. I raised my eyes to my mother's face. The smile I knew and loved so well still lingered about her features. But there was something in her face 
which I had never seen before. A weird beauty not of this world, which caused me to leap from my bed and clasp her in my arms and call her name. My dear mother gave me no answer. God had called her away. I pass over in silence this the supreme sorrow of my life. Even during the first sharp agony of loss, it became evident to my father that it would not be prudent to leave me unguarded. The death of my mother had a very disturbing effect on me, and my restlessness during sleeping hours grew more alarming. The question then arose as to the choice of a night watch. My father was not easily satisfied. He sought for some fit person throughout the city, but apparently to no purpose. At length, he resolved to advertise in our daily paper, the Sessionsville Democrat, and accordingly the following appeared in its columns. Wanted, a night nurse. Must be steady and thoroughly reliable. Apply for further information to John D. 13 Madison Street, Sessionsville, Missouri. Quite promptly that morning, the applicants came pouring in. My father and the doctor made short work of some, found great difficulty in putting off others, and finally, through sheer desperation, chose the least of many evils, as they thought, in the person of a woman, giving her name as Mrs. Ada Rayner. As I say, it was for lack of a more satisfactory applicant that they chose her, for her evidences of a character, as the saying is, were dark. To their searching inquiries, her answers were vague and unsatisfactory. Whence she came? What were her past circumstances? They strove vainly to ascertain. The words into which she put her answers, while giving evidence of a good education, and indeed of no little refinement, only served to thicken the mist that obscured her past. For all that, she was duly installed, though my father frowned and the doctor shook his learned head. As for myself, notwithstanding the fact that I was at an age when inquisitiveness is keen, I was not so difficult to please in the matter as my elders. What does the small boy care for the past, when the present is so full of novelties and delights, when the future is brimming with unknown wonders and magnificent possibilities? Here was Mrs. Rayner, bright and smiling, with pleasant answers to all my questions, and many a gorgeous eastern tale to while away an idle hour. Her past was nothing to me. In brief, I came very shortly to love her much, and though my father and the doctor could not be brought to believe it, she certainly seemed to return my affection. She had a soft, gentle way of calling me Harry, which brought back vividly the tones and accents of my dear mother. There were other gracious resemblances, moreover, which I discovered for myself, and it came about quite naturally, in course of time, that I began to call her Mama. There was no doubt about the radiant smile which greeted me when I first addressed her by that endearing name. Nor at the time did it seem as though I had in any wise misapplied the term. To me she was in fact a mother. In her I placed all the confidence of a child's innocent, unsuspecting love. That love, as after events go to prove, was within a little of wrecking my life. Every term of affection was afterward to be paid for in days of sickness and sorrow. Beyond doubt, Mrs. Rayner was a faithful nurse. It was her wont to sleep from early morn till noontime, but afternoon and night she was my constant attendant. Whenever my itty sink racing threatened me, she was at once beside me to soothe me and restrain my wanderings, my love grew with the months and served to take off much of the bitterness of that first sharp grief. And now let me begin my story proper. It was about sundown on the 21st of December, the day after my 11th birthday. I was lying on a rug close to the glowing hearth fire in our sitting room, reading for the 10th or 11th time the absorbing tale of Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves and had just reached that exciting passage where Morgiana pours boiling water into the jars, wherein the thieves have hidden themselves, 
when a brisk, firm step without brought me to my feet. Well did I know my father's footfall, and I hastened from the sitting-room into the hallway to meet and greet him at the door. To me his return was ever one of the pleasantest moments of the day. As he opened the door he always found me waiting within, and raising me in his arms would give me a fatherly kiss. That was all. He rarely spoke. On this occasion, however, he did speak. "'Harry, I've got great news for you,' he began as he returned me to the floor. "'Of course you remember your Uncle James, don't you?' I shivered at the name. Uncle James had been the bugaboo of my life. He had been face to face with me only once, but that was enough. The interview was a short one. Yet short as it was, my uncle had spoken so harshly, frowned so forbiddingly, and made such ugly faces that I had retired that night with my fancy at the complete mercy of all manner of hideous pictures. My fear and aversion were not astonishing, inasmuch as my uncle seemed to inspire the like feelings into all who came in contact with him. The old man was universally detested. From all I had heard, he was very rich and very ugly, very harsh and very miserly. Remember Uncle James, Papa? Indeed I do. Well, something strange has come over him, poor James. He's a diamond in the rough, for he's really making a show of being genial. Look at this. And unbuttoning his overcoat, my father took out a large yellow envelope from which he produced a letter. See, he said, holding it up before my eyes. Read for me, Papa. You know I can't read writing. Listen, then. I won't skip a word. Tower Hill Mansion, December 20, 1800. Mr. John D., dear brother. Here my father paused while the muscles of his face twitched. From after experiences I infer that he was unable to reconcile his knowledge of my uncle with a warmth of affection implied in the term dear. He went on reading, however, without comment. I want your son Harry, my nephew Harry, to come to my house Christmas Eve and stay overnight. Important business. Your brother, James D., if my father counted on my being gratified by the wish thus curtly expressed in this letter, he was certainly deceived. The thought of passing a night under my uncle's roof was unbearable. Oh, Papa, I don't want to go. Why not, Harry? I must confess that at this stage of the conversation I blubbered. Be because he's an ugly old man, and he lives away out in the country, and, and, here my grief grew more intense, I c can't bear him. Well, Harry, I didn't imagine you were such a coward. This put a check to my tears. And to think, continued my father, a trifle sternly, that a son of mine should speak of my brother as an ugly old man. I began to feel uncomfortable. I realized that I had put myself in the wrong. After all, he was my uncle. Can Mrs. Rayner come along? I asked concessively. Of course, that's understood. I'll speak to her at once. But no less to my surprise than to my father's, upon his asking her to accompany me, she showed the greatest agitation. Is it necessary for me to go? She asked, after a moment of reflection. "'Well, it's not absolutely necessary,' answered my father. "'Then I'll not go.' My father changed countenance. Mamma, I cried, catching her hand. "'Will you let me go alone to that house in the country?' Mrs. Rayner drew me close, and her face softened. "'My dear Harry, I'll miss you very much while you're gone. "'But it will be better that someone else go with you.' But, Mama, I want you. Won't you please come? In a voice strangely agitated, Mrs. Rayner answered, I'll go. Yes, for your sake, Harry, I'll go. 
On the 24th of December, accordingly, we took the morning train for Tower Hill, and I must say the day passed very pleasantly indeed. Toward nightfall, we reached Tower Hill Station, where we found awaiting us a rusty carriage under charge of a rusty driver, who shut us in with a sullen jerk and drove us off at moderate speed to my uncle's mansion. That night proved to be an eventful one in my life. End of chapter 1